What's going on, everyone? This is Sheets, uh, a.k.a. Eric Haber, a.k.a. Sheets. And before I go through this breakdown, I want to just kind of give a summary uh, of what this is. Uh, as you guys may or may not know, my uh, nickname, Sheets, was originally derived from the horse racing product, uh, Len Ragazin's The Sheets, which is a very advanced data source that I use as part of my handicapping process, which I've been using for many, many years. And uh, every once in a while, I will do some horse racing content, but very, very rarely, partially because, I mean, very few people are interested in it. And second of all, usually if I give out values and who I like, it's going to affect my price. Um, unfortunately, or well, fortunately, the Breeders' Cup is not one of those days. It's one of a very few amount of days where I can essentially tell everybody who I'm playing and what the good values are and not worrying about my price because it's just so much money in the pools. Uh, also, it's an extremely strong day to play because all of the casuals and all of the public are out there piling money in. So uh, as part of my true DFS stuff, uh, every once in a while, I will put up some horse racing values and not to get too into my history with this stuff, but suffice to say that Okay, uh, I can give you some good advice on the stock market. I can give you some good advice on backgammon and chess. And uh, if you wanted to pass the bar exam, I could give you really, really good good advice on that. But you're, probably your biggest EV bump in listening to anything that I have in my arsenal is going to be from this, um, is from, from horse racing analysis and assessing value. So uh, I'm not going to get into all the details of how I come up with my percentages or how I come up with my values. Uh, it's just going to be just kind of giving back to the true DFS community. And by, you know, by, by Nate, by its nature, whoever is watching these videos. So uh, I encourage you guys, if you are going to play the Breeders' Cup, uh, well, I shouldn't encourage you. What I will say is that you are going to do no better than, uh, than following my advice on your own. Uh, you're going to be no, you're going to do no better on your own than following my advice. So with that said, we're going to get right into the breakdown and hope you guys do well. And if you want to, you know, pay me back, or if you want to, you know, say thank you in some way, um, sign up for true DFS. We, we do a really, really good job with daily fantasy sports. And if that is something that you're interested in, uh, Bobby Firestone and I, uh, you know, set up this site a couple of years ago and I really enjoy doing content for it. And, you know, the more people that view it, the more, you know, I enjoy it. <laughs> so uh, I do encourage you guys to, to check that out. But uh, aside from that, uh, stay tuned for the Breeders' Cup Breakdown. Hey, everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the Breeders' Cup for uh, this weekend. Uh, a couple of announcements. I am recording this somewhat early. I mean, I do have the the morning lines and I have analyzed the card and I think I have an idea of what the best values are, but there's a lot that can happen between now and race day. Most dramatically there could be scratches, which uh, might take some of my picks away. It might reduce uh, some value. So uh, this is not exactly you know, timely, but it's it's better than nothing. And I promise this, that if there is a significant update between now and race day, uh, I'll record again. I also considered uh, doing a live stream during race day. Uh, we're going to have to see what my time commitment looks like for either or both Friday or Saturday. This is also not going to involve a lot of analysis. In other words, I'm not going to get into why I like who I like and, and all kinds of sheet theory and things like that. I'm just kind of not interested in that. For the purposes of the Breeders' Cup and whenever I do horse racing content, I'm really just going to uh, give my picks. In other words, I'm going to give you my top values, uh, give you a little bit of guidance of how to play them, and a little bit of, of I don't know, guidance with respect to the odds because – I, I might say something like, okay, this looks good at six to one. And then if it shows up at three to one, it becomes a, a terrible bet. And that's sort of the reality with, with horse racing and betting on horses is you really shouldn't commit to anything and you really shouldn't be betting anything until, I mean, uh, optimally about 30 seconds to post time, right? Because then you will know exactly what odds you're getting. However, uh, for the Breeders' Cup, there's so much money in the pools that 
I don't think the odds are going to be dramatically different from the morning line. Um, but uh, I will hopefully give you some, you know, some degree of guidance as far as that goes. Um, and I guess we're going to kind of get going. Uh, we're going to do f both days. We're going to do Friday and Saturday. And usually I spend a lot of time on both days uh, going through picks. But when it comes to Friday, there isn't all that much. I mean, I'm going to go over the, you know, the, the, the values that I do think are worth betting, but um, coincidentally, actually, the majority of the great values are coming from Saturday and not from Friday. So for those who are just going on Saturday for the main, you know, the main Breeders' Cup day um, or otherwise just interested in Saturday, you could skip through this, I guess. But there's not going to be too much I go over with respect to Friday anyway. Okay, so we're using the Breeders' Cup uh, official program here. Um, I'm not going to get into my sheets. I'm not going to get into anything except for what I think are good values. All right. Um for first race on Friday, I would like to mention that I do think red flag is a lock, um, a lock meaning that probably is going to win the race more than 50% of the time. And unfortunately, his odds are probably going to be worse than that. I mean, he, he's eight to five morning line here. I imagine he'll end up at three to five or something like that. So there really isn't a lot of value here. But if you did want to hook him up with some stuff later, which we'll get into, I, I guess it's not too bad. All right, um, let's move on to the second race. Second race, just to get through it, I really don't see any value at all. I thought the one, two, three, four, and six were all you know, solid enough, and you're not going to get any value betting any of them um, after rake and vig and whatever, so you probably don't want to bet the race at all. But again, uh, depending on how much you're degening or you know what kind of action you want, you, you could play the five race one with the one, two, three, four, six race two leading into race three, where I do have my first bit of value uh, for the weekend. And all these people here are getting free advertisement. Okay, so race three in the Golden Gate Juvenile Philly Stakes. Um, the the favorite, the one is is you know is not bad actually, but the nine horse in the air tonight. Uh, he is, as far as my analysis goes, just as likely to win as the one, and the nine is uh, has fifteen to one morning line. So uh, the nine is is the clear value in this race. Uh, you, you could just bet the nine to win. You could box him with the one in exactas, or what you could do is use those kind of fishy values in races one, two, three to hook him up in maybe a pick three or a pick four or a pick five. The only reason I would say that that's not that bad of an idea, even though races one and two are, are pretty fishy, is that there is a chance that this morning line is just really bad and people you know, do see what I see somehow, and he ends up being, say, six to one uh, in the wind pool. Um, but he'll end up being more than that in the pick three pool because, again, people are betting in race one. They don't see what these the odds are in, in race three yet, really. And they, they don't see what their probables are for the pick three. So these high morning line odds that probably should be lower are usually better bet in at the you know the, the further end of pick threes and pick fours things like that so uh i definitely think the nine is good value and you can use the one you know in exact as if if you want um all right so the rest of these the rest of the races well i shouldn't say the rest of the races uh are not are not good but let me just kind of blast through them um race four I actually thought the two smash it wasn't bad at 10 to one. Now that I'm looking at this and also the 10 chasing Liberty. There's lots of horses that can win this race though. Um, this is what makes it really, really difficult. The, these early races, because if you want to play the pick four, pick five, you're really getting no value in races one and two and race four is such a crapshoot. But again, if you want to be really, you know, wanted to go for it you would play the two smash it and or the 10 chasing liberty uh with the previous race value the nine so if you want like real pure equity you'll play the daily doubles maybe with the nine race three with the two ten and race four it's going to hit maybe one out of i don't know 60 times but it's probably going to pay 200 
uh, on a two dollar bet. So you're you're going to be getting value on that. But again, it just doesn't win all too often. But again, if you're betting anyway, that's that's what I would advise. All right, race five. I try. I really try on Breeders' Cup Day to to not be so stingy with my values um, and give you guys something to bet on. But race five is just brutal. I mean, I, the one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, they're all almost equal. Uh, I shouldn't say almost equal. You know, the nine is definitely worse, but I think it makes up for that with odds. So there's really nothing to bet there in race five. And then in race six, it's it's no better. I literally have this all with the exception of the nine. I think literally everybody can win this race relative to their odds. I, I don't think there's a single bit of value that you can bet there. I mean, if anything, I mean, technically you're just supposed to bet the longest shots in those races, maybe, but there, it's really just nothing to do. Um, all right. Race number seven. And then as, as we lead into the late pick four, I mean, I guess this would get somewhat interesting. Race seven, I wrote down several horses, the, the one, three, four, five, seven, ten, all with kind of equal chances. So this one vodka with a twist at 20 to one, I think it's good enough that how do I describe this? I mean, if if you were out and you know were doing something better for the day or you were watching TV or out in the sun or whatever, I would not race back or race to your phone to bet this. But if you're there, D Jenny anyway, or if you if it's not too big of a deal, uh, I think it's it's worth the effort to to take a shot at this one at twenty to one. Hopefully that that kind of emphasizes how lukewarm I think the wager is. But if you're there betting anyway, I really think that that's where the value is. But one, three, four, five, seven, ten. But vodka twist I think is the you know the the bet you probably should make if you're betting at all. Um, all right, so now we're into kind of the chalk parade here. Um, Race eight, the Juvenile Phillies turf. I unfortunately think that Lake Victoria is going to win. I think it's going to win more than 50% of the time. And I also think that it's going to be priced at about three to four, three to five or four to five. So there's really not a lot of value in there. Um, So again, if you want to bet vodka twist with Lake Victoria, I guess that's fine. Uh, Race eight, uh, excuse me, race nine. So we can go through all these advertisements. Race nine is very similar. I think the 10 Chancer McPatrick is a very, you know, legitimate favorite. I will say actually East Avenue is the morning line favorite. So technically the 10 does have a little bit of value. I do think the 10 is the most likely winner by an okay amount. I just don't think you're going to get a you know good enough price on it. I mean, if you get two to one, ugh, it's probably just not value enough if you get four to one you could probably bet it you're probably just not going to get enough good enough odds to bet on it but it is probably the most likely winner so if you are betting you know, maybe maybe take a shot with that one again you, you want to get some value somewhere so maybe again that vodka twist with the favorite in race eight with sort of the favorite in race nine maybe it makes maybe that's okay but you just don't want vodka twist to somehow win and then these kind of like fishy favorites just fail, you know, and then you're like, oh, why didn't I just bet that other one to win? Uh, and likewise, the 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 final race, the juvenile turf race, uh, New Century, the eleven is is the most likely winner. You're probably not going to get enough good enough price on him, and it's probably not worth betting. So, in in summary, the Friday Breeders' Cup day is is pretty bad with respect to value. Uh, you could highlight that nine in uh, race three. Uh, and you could surround it with kind of just blah favorites and okay spreads. The the two and the ten in race four, as I highlighted, that's not bad for for a bomb. The one vodka twist in race seven, that's not bad for a bomb. But overall, it's it's not the greatest betting card in the world. Now I'm going to be betting it, but uh, it's just not it's not the greatest. But that's what I think of Friday. All right, let's get into it. Breeders' Cup Day Saturday. It's it's one of the most bizarre cards. I don't know what they did. I think they took a page from the World Series of Poker where like the World Series of Poker, it used to culminate with the main event, which makes perfect sense. But over the past five or 10 years, they decided to put all these events after it. 
which just to me makes no sense. It's almost like playing the World Series of baseball and then following it up with like 20 regular season games. It's just ridiculous. Um, from a marketing perspective, I would think, but I guess they have their reasons. And this year, for I can't imagine why. I mean, I guess I could imagine why. I don't even feel like speculating, but the Breeders' Cup Classic is race eight out of 12. There's one, two, three, four Breeders' Cup races after that. I guess to make, I don't know, it's to encourage people to come for longer, I suppose. I, I, I can't imagine why they're doing this. And it also, if you, you bet the pick six, it is, um, it's race two of the of the pick six. You know what? I should probably, just for funsies, um, talk about what you could do for the Friday pick six card. I mean, it's not the way it pans out. It's the last six races on the card. So all three of those big spread races, races five, six, seven, you could spread as many horses you feel like spending on. And then you could just go a cold pick three, those last three favorites. Um, so basically you'll be not guaranteed, but in good shape to be alive for the pick six with three favorites, which is usually not what you're, what you're looking for, but that is what you could do. But we will talk about the pick six for, uh, for the Breeders' Cup as well when we get to it. But it's a very, very weird order of order of races. All right. So let's just start with race one, which is the Sunrise. It is not a Breeders' Cup race, but we're treating all these races as Breeders' Cup races. Okay, right off the bat, there are five horses I think can win here at decent prices. And the one that I think is the best value is right off the bat, the one in the first race, and that would be Spycatcher. Um, he's 15 to one morning line. I would bet him at over 10. Uh, and he just looks really, really good for his price. Uh, no secret six to one is not bad. Stand my passport you can use as well in, you know, some pick threes, pick fours or whatever. And then also King Apollo, not the longest price in the world, eight to one, but he's not bad. Lahaina flavor, just again, just kind of okay at, at five to one. And then if the 13 gets in, he's um, also eligible. A lottery pick is not bad as well. But uh, I do think that the one, as I mentioned, is the best overall value. And, you know, as, as we talk about later races, you can decide for yourself how to play this. If you want to just get off to a good start, you'll play all the ones I mentioned, like one, four, five, nine, 11, 13. But if you want to just, you know, just try to go for the throat right off the bat, you'll just key the one, play the one to win. You'll play them on top of exactties. You'll start them in pick threes and, and all that kind of good stuff. Okay, race two is extremely chalky. Um, the three Hope Road. He is six to five morning line. He's probably going to be one to five, um, meaning that you bet five dollars, you profit one if it wins. Uh, I, I'm just guessing. The only thing you can really do in this race, and I do think that she's going to win like 70% of the time, is you could try to play the exacta here. And the two, Desert Dawn, I think is kind of clearly the second horse. Um, it's 10 to one morning line as opposed to Alpha Bello, who's actually eight to five morning line. Uh, I I can't imagine Alpha Bello is even remotely close to Hope Road in odds. So maybe what you can do is find some value playing the exact of Hope Road over Desert Dawn. Now it's hard to tell what a good price is, and you're going to be kind of having to look at the exacta pool throughout the, throughout, you know, the, the pre-race. I guess if you can get $30, on a $2 bet on that exacta, I guess that's good value. I think you'll get it. I mean, they, they have a lot of the publics at this event and, and you they'll see an eight to five shot and probably just presume it has a chance to win. I, I really think that, you know, if you wanted to, you could play, if you can get a head to head, like desert dawn versus alpha Bella and get odds. I think that's probably where the best value is in this race. Um, we'll get to any, another good example of that as we get to the classic, but um, um, yeah, so that's what I would do in this race. I mean, you really, I would not try to beat that, uh, that three horse. Okay. 
All right, so in the third race, there's a couple of decent ones here, but my favorite value overall is the three fluffy socks. Now you're gonna, I'm just telling you, you're going to you're going to be nervous and sweating and whatever it is throughout this race because he this horse, she loves to just kind of stay all the way back and and attempt to weave her way through the field. So she's gonna have the possibility of having trip troubles, but that's just kind of the way it goes. But at, at 10 to 1, uh, I think that she's clearly the most likely winner. I think the 5 is okay. 5 is uh, Fuente Ovejuna. She is definitely a little bit worse. But at 30 to 1, I think she's worth kind of including in all your exotics. And another solid horse is, is Nadette, the 8. Uh, she's going to have a similar issue as the 3 with respect to trying to work out a trip. From way in the back, but nonetheless, I think she's very solid. So I would use all three of those. I would use the three, the five, and the eight. The three is, you know, very solid at 10 to one. The five, you know, it's going to be like a billion to one. Uh, so you just, you're just going to want it if it wins. And the eight, Nadette is solid enough. Maybe not the greatest price in the world, but not bad. So I would use all three of those, the three, the five, and the eight. You could use pick threes starting with all those horses in race one or just the one in race one with the favorite in race number two um, with this with these three horses, three, five, eight in race three. You could start stuff with three, five, eight. But I don't think you should do that because as we get to race four, race four is extremely poor. Um, I have like a zillion horses listed as having a chance, even relative to their price. So there's not a lot of value there, I, but I'll just throw it out there. One, two, three, four, five, six, nine, ten. 10. Um, you know, all those have shots relative to their price, really no value at all. All right, moving on to race number five. Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. Uh, unfortunately, I think a nine is solid. Um, but if you want some value, the two Motorious, I think, would be the place to go. Um, it's it's does not going to win as often as Cogburn, but I think relative to his odds, I think it's it's definitely worth a shot here. So I would say, again, depending on your risk tolerance, uh, if you want to just you know play long shots, I think that Motorious is perfectly good value. It's not like a layover. It's not like the most likely winner at eight to one, but uh, and we'll get to some of those later, but uh, I think it's fair enough. So again, if you're chalky, I would go you know, use the two nine. Um, or if you're a little more aggressive, I would just use the two. Okay. Now we get into race five, which is the breeders cup. Well, that was the uh, Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. Sorry about that. Race number six. Um, this is the Distaff. This is a total chalk parade. The 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 two Torpedo Anna and the six Raging Sea are going to run one two. I think um, Torpedo Anna is going to win this race seventy percent of the time. Uh, I think Raging Sea is going to win the other maybe fifteen, and then. The rest can be spread out among these other horses. I just don't think there's any reason to play either of these two horses. Um, and and I also don't think there's any reason to play them. You know, they're both very, very short. They're not going to be value at all. But again, if you want to hook up, you know, races together, you could play the two and the six and, you know, make your pick threes work, your pick fours work and, and things like that. Okay. Um now we're going on to race number seven, which is the Breeders' Cup Turf. Um, this one, unfortunately, is a spread with no value. Uh, I, I literally wrote down all except for 9, 10, and 12. So you, you really shouldn't start anything with this race, I don't think, unless you're betting the pick six, in which case you, you're probably likely to be alive if you follow my advice because i really think you could almost throw out no no horses so i would go all with no 9 10 or 11 or excuse me 9 10 or 12 and you can certainly you know uh you know watch for scratches things like that so i actually wrote down a little, a little bit better than that i wrote down one two three four five seven eleven 
So that's what I would do, I guess, in race seven. Race eight, which is the Breeders' Cup Classic. Okay, so I still don't know why they're making this the second race, the pick six, and only race number eight, but it is what it is. Um, I really think it's completely a two-horse race here. And one of those horses is 12 to 1. Uh, let's start with a favorite. Okay, City of Troy. Now, again, you're, you're probably going to get some some love for this horse. I mean, it won every race in Europe. It's 5 to 2 morning line. I, I, I think it's one of the least likely winners of the race. I mean, if you could get... It's... I mean, you'd have to really hunt around for this, but I, I was talking to one of my friends about this. I, I if I could get say a hundred to one. Hold on one second. Hello. It is. Yeah. So if you could get a hundred to one to have for City of Troy to come in last, I would probably do it. Um. And again, this could end up being just a terrible take, but I, I don't know. I, I I literally think it has the least chance to win of everybody in the race. Um, but it is a two-horse race between um, Fierceness, in my opinion, Fierceness the nine, uh, and Sierra Leone the eleven. I make them. I make Fierceness a little bit better. I would say that Fierceness has about thirty-five percent chance to win this race, and maybe Sierra Leone about twenty-five percent. And the rest is kind of, you know, uh, are spread out. I do think it's a very, very close race among everybody else for third. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a classic like this in like a while, at least on the sheets. So, uh, how do you play that? Well, there's a couple of things you could do. Uh, you could just play Sierra Leone, and that's probably from an equity perspective the best way to play. But fierceness does look really good, and it is the most likely winner. So, I don't know. It depends on what you're looking to accomplish here, uh, and how much money you have to spend. You should you should play the nine eleven, and I wouldn't play anybody else in the race at all. And it's up to you whether you want to just play the eleven. Um, I would not just play the nine. The eleven is just is is really really good value, Sierra Leone. But I think that those two just kind of lay over the field. What I was going to say is that if you could get, you know, head to head wagering on some rate on some books that used to be able to do that, either bet online or other places, if you could get a head to head, like even money on fierceness versus, uh, what did I say? City of Troy. That could be the best horse racing bet I've ever seen. Um, it's possible. Like, like if you if you can actually get that, just a head to head bet, fierceness against City of Troy. I literally think that I think that fierceness is ninety percent to beat City of Troy. Um, but um, the, the cool thing the cool thing about horse racing, and really all gambling, is that I can say whatever I want, and if City of Troy wins. I could say, well, this is one of the 10%. But uh, the fact is, is that uh, Fiercest wins, beats City of Troy, I'm telling you, like 90% of the time. Uh, but as far as betting the race goes, I would say, again, 9-11, very super solid way to play. Or if you just want to you know, use Sierra Leone, that's a very aggressive way to play. And yes, you could play exact as Fiercest with Sierra Leone both ways. And... um. And that's the that's the classic. All right, race number nine. The what race is this? The Philly and Mare Turf. Uh to spread. I really don't like much at all. I'm just gonna read off the horses I like here. Two, three, five, um, eight, nine, ten. And then 12. Uh, so again, nothing really do. Not, I would not. Well, if you started bets with the 9 12 in the classic and you lost and you're on tilt, yeah. Okay. Then you could restart them up in race nine because there's stuff coming up in race 10, which we, which we're going to want to bet. 
Um, but there's really no reason to start anything in race nine if you're alive after race eight. Okay. Race 10, actually, there's, it's race 11 you wanted to bet stuff. We'll get to that. Race 10, the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Um, all right. It's usually, there's usually quite a bit of variance in the sprint. Uh, I do like a couple of things. Raging Torrent at 10 to 1 looks very, very good relative to his price. Um, straight No Chaser, not real value, but but it's definitely one of the top contenders. Mul Mulliken, definitely not great value, but one of the top contenders for sure. Skelly is okay, but again, not the greatest value in the world at 8 to 1. Two other bombs I want to just throw out there. So Gun Pilot at 20 to 1 should definitely be used in exactas, trifectas, even in like pick threes and fives. And then even this Ben, ben Toronto, Ben Toronto, Ben Tornado is fine too. So I think the one is the way to start raging torrent, but the sprint has so much variance. I would use them all really like one, eight, 10, 11, and then two, six. Um, I think they all have shots. Okay. Race number 11. Some really, really good values in race 11, the Breeders' Cup mile. Almost too many. You'd have to kind of prioritize these. First of all, the two like, kind of solid favorites are Johannes, the nine, and, and Carl Spackler, number 12. Um, but the values are clearly three other horses, right? Um, Chili Flag, the two, Geoglyph, and More Than Looks. I think these three are just as likely to win, if not more so, than the nine and the 12. So these are the three horses you really want to key in all of your wagers. And they're they're a billion to one. Okay. Um again, like you said, like I said, depending on what you're live with from before, you could start new ones off if you wanted to. The problem is, is that races eleven and twelve are so bad. But you, you really have to bet all three of these. It's chili flag, geoglyph more than looks. Even though Johannes and Charles Carl Spackler are just as likely to win, the 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 value on these is so strong. You should bet all three of these in exactness with each other, like a box two three eight. If you want to get really exotic, you can go two three eight on top and then use the nine and the twelve underneath. So two three eight with two three eight nine twelve. Um, but these are the three key values, um, maybe on the whole card. Um, they're extremely, extremely strong. Uh, but again, I wouldn't say the nine and the twelve are bad. They're just they're just a little bit shorter relative to their you know their chances of winning. Okay, just a couple of races to get through, and they're neither of them are that great as far as betting goes. Actually, just one more to get through. Sorry. So race number twelve, the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. It's just kind of a spread, I have to say. Uh, Saudi Crown looks pretty good. The two most likely winners are the two favorites, Domestic Product and Muth, the uh, 9 and the 10. Uh, but then are there are some bombs in here, if you want. Um, the Tumbarumba, the 7, at like a million to 1, that looks pretty good. Saudi, Saudi Crown is not good value at all, but, but it's just as likely to win, I think, as this Domestic Product and Muth. Uh, Mufasa is not terrible. Cagliostro is a is a pretty good long shot at 30 to 1. So I guess it depends on like listen, it depends on how much you're down for the day, right? If you need to get out for the day, you're gonna play Tumbarumba and Cagliarosto. Those are the two big bombs. Um, but domestic product, Muth, Saudi Crown, they they all look pretty good. And full Serrano, if you're gonna play like you know, uh, E5s or anything like that, they can fill out your exactas and trifectas and all that kind of stuff. So again, just to kind of review. Uh, there are some really good values on Saturday, uh, more so than on Friday. And if I do come up with anything different between now and then, I will probably post an update. Um, and I'm considering doing something with a live stream where I go with updated odds and things like that. But aside from that, it 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 is a pretty, pretty good betting card, especially Saturday. Um, and hopefully this uh, this helps. Again, some some caveats. Don't bet anything until five minutes to post if you can. 
because you want to see last minute stuff that happens with the odds. Um, and I guess that's it. Uh, biggest day of the year as far as uh, horse racing goes. Hope you guys enjoy. <laughs>